today I may have the most important thing to tell you. Certainly I'm going to tell you the most motivating thing as far as diet and lifestyle is concerned. I'm going to talk to you about goal number four, which is to prevent a disaster, and that disaster is cancer. You know, when you die, it's just as cold in the coffin, whether you die of heart disease or cancer. But somehow, cancer is much more scary. Why is cancer so scary? It's because it's a deadly disease, isn't it? And it's a dehumanizing disease, too. It takes you little by little and takes away your dignity. And also, the treatments. They're worse than the disease in many cases. So if I could pick anything to motivate you with, it's the idea that you can win the war on cancer, but you can only win it by prevention. And you can win it by prevention because we know what causes approximately 90% of cancers. It's due to our diet and our environment. So knowing that, we can take action and win the war on cancer by prevention. I would like to focus our discussion on breast cancer because it's a highly emotional disease. But if you don't like breast cancer, every time I say breast, you say prostate. Because it's the same disease in men that breast cancer is in women. About uh, 30 years ago, one in 20 women in this country developed breast cancer. When I first started getting interested in this disease, which was about 20 years ago, one in 14 women developed breast cancer. You may have heard the figure of 1 in 10, and that used to be commonly talked about, but actually the official American Cancer Society figure is that 1 in 8 women will get cancer sometime in their lifetime. Unless you happen to be from a wealthy community, then it's even higher. And I predict someday you will see figures of 1 in 5 or 20% of the female population will get breast cancer sometime in their lifetime. Plus it's becoming a younger disease. 20 years ago when I first got interested in this disease, if you were 50 and had breast cancer, you were a young woman. But these days, women in their 20s and 30s are developing this disease. And not just because of early detection, but also because it's becoming more common. Now that's in this country. In other parts of the world, they have much less breast cancer and prostate cancer. For example, in Japan, they have one-fourth to one-seventh the chance of getting breast cancer. In this slide, what we're looking at is fat intake. And what you see is the Japanese have a low-fat diet. When you double the fat intake and look at Italy, where they consume all that health food olive oil, they have twice the chance of getting breast cancer. Now, quadruple the fat intake from the Japanese and look at the people in the United States. Four times the breast cancer incidence. But you know, it's not right to say fat causes breast cancer. You'll lose an argument if you do. The real answer is the rich American diet causes breast cancer, and it's got all kinds of qualities that set you up for cancer. It's high in fat, and fat promotes cancer in experimental studies. Because it's high in fat, it's high in calories, and high-calorie diets promote cancer. It's also high in vegetable fats, which suppress the immune system, like safflower oil and corn oil, and encourage the growth of cancer. It's high in synthetic fats that are in margarines and shortenings. They're called trans fats. And these trans fats, because they're not natural, get into the cell walls. And because of their structure, which is not natural, they leave gaping holes in the cell walls that allow cancer-causing chemicals to get in. The rich American diet is high in animal protein, which suppresses the immune system. It's high in cholesterol, and cholesterol acts as a cancer helper, a co-carcinogen, we call it. Now, it's also missing things that are important. The rich American diet misses uh, antioxidants that are in plant foods, like beta-carotene is only in plant foods. Vitamin C is only in plant foods. Most of your vitamin E is in plant foods. It misses dietary fiber, which grabs a hold, binds, and prevents cancer-causing chemicals from getting into your system. And it also misses, because it's low in plant foods, a whole category of chemicals called phytochemicals. And one of the commonly discussed phytochemicals is phytoestrogen. They sell this to you in various products, like Promenso. You're promoted soy products because of the phytoestrogens. What these are is they're weak estrogens that are found in plants, phyto meaning plant. And these west, weak estrogens, they go into your body and they attach to the estrogen receptors in your cells. And when they get attached to the estrogen receptors, they block out natural or estrogens that you make in your own body that are stronger. You make estrogens in your body fat and in your ovaries. 
And as they flow through the system, because the phytoestrogens are solidly attached to the estrogen receptor, they can't get in there and overstimulate your cells and promote cancer. Now, I'm not a strong promoter of people taking concentrated phytoestrogens in the form of pills or in the form of soy products. But what I like people to do is to take the natural phytoestrogens, the, the large quantity of phytoestrogens, of the great variety of phytoestrogens that are fine, found in plant foods. All kinds of phytochemicals. In fact, you ought to think about it like this. is When you eat these plant foods, these starches, vegetables, and fruits, they have dozens of chemicals that we've discovered, and I'm sure hundreds if not thousands of chemicals to be discovered that go into your cells and bathe the cells and work with the machinery and keep the cells healthy and protect us from cancer. They deactivate those chemicals that are so common in the rich American diet, those environmental carcinogens that get in there and try and turn the cells against you. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I wasn't playing fair there. I was showing you Japanese women who are generally tinier women compared to primarily white women in the United States. And you say that's probably, probably the difference, the difference in size of the women. Well, the way we can see that's not the case is we watch what happens when people change their diets. And they do that in two ways. They do it by moving to new countries, migrating, and they do it by changing their diet in their own country. For example, the Japanese living in Japan have a very low incidence of breast cancer. If you take and move the Japanese lady to Hawaii and you study her in 1963 when fast food was a Simon stand, they had no Burger Kings or Kentucky Fried Chickens, her incidence of breast cancer almost doubled. Now study the Japanese lady who lives in San Francisco. She's fully westernized, and you see that she has the same chance of getting breast cancer as a white woman in this country. Race has nothing to do with this disease. It has everything to do with the one to five pounds of environment we take in for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, let's take a look at the change of diet within a country. After World War II, we taught the Japanese people the American way. We sent them our fast food restaurants. Oh, they wanted to be just like Americans. And so they changed their diet. They increased their intake of fat, increased their intake of animal protein, decreased their intake of rice and vegetables. And during that 20-year post-war period of time, they doubled the incidence of breast cancer in the country of Japan. Now, investigators, they wanted to study this more thoroughly, so they took the Japanese women living in Japan, and they separated them into groups. At one extreme, you had the Japanese women who lived on the tradi traditional diet of rice, vegetables, and little bits of fish. And they compared this to the other extreme, which were women they called rich. And the way you got into that group is you ate meat only seven times a week or more. And they found the, in, the difference in incidence of breast cancer was 850%. This is happening all over the world. In Singapore, in 1970, the incidence of breast cancer doubled among the Singaporean women between 1970 and 1990. And by 2000, it was expected to triple. People all over the world want to be like Americans. They want to be rich. They want to eat rich foods. Well, hey, if you're going to do that, then you're going to take on our diseases too. We've been doing experiments since the 1930s where you take animals and you feed them various kinds of diets and see whether or not you can promote cancer in these animals. What we find is the strongest promoter of cancer in our diet is vegetable oil. Now, some vegetable oils are more cancer-promoting than others. The omega-6 vegetable oils, like are found predominantly in safflower and corn oil, are very strong promoters of cancer. Lard and olive oil are kind of mixed in their results, but believe me, there are studies that show olive oil is quite good at promoting cancer. Now, fish fats have a very low chance of promoting cancer, but there are circumstances that you can set up in a laboratory where fish fat also becomes cancer promoting. And those circumstances exist in natural environments. So my recommendation to you is to avoid all free oils. Free oil is unnatural. It has to be processed to be free. When it's mixed up in the nut or the seed or the corn, then it's surrounded with uh, phytates and fibers and vitamins and minerals and all kinds of chemicals that protect it so it's healthy for you. But you separate it from that natural environment, then it will be a burden on you and also promote disease. In the rich Western diet, we have all kinds of chemicals. And I believe that it's the chemicals that not only initiate but also promote cancer. These are things that they put in the environment to fertilize, that spill from plants, 
things like dioxin and DDE and DDT and heptachlor, things that get into the environment and they get into us in high concentrations when we eat rich foods. The way it works is this. We start with these chemicals on grains and grasses and because they're fat soluble, when the cow comes along and eats the grains and grasses, these chemicals get concentrated in the cow's fat. They get sucked up and concentrated. So the cow has many, many times, thousands of times more concentrated chemicals than originally appeared on the grains and grasses. And then we eat the cow, and we concentrate it even more. And then at the end of that food chain, the one that gets the greatest concentration is the baby nursing on mother's breast. It's estimated that 80% of the environmental contaminants that get into people are a result of consuming meats, poultry, fish, and dairy. So one way to avoid these cancer-initiating and cancer-promoting chemicals is to eat low on the food chain. And even better would be to eat organic and low on the food chain. Now, there is a tie between diet and hormones and cancer that I'd like to talk to you about. You realize that cancer has this hormone association. You realize it because women have breast cancer 100 times more than men. You may realize also, you may know also, that women who lose their ovaries early in life have a much reduced chance of getting breast cancer. And women who take hormones for osteoporosis have about a 50% greater chance of getting breast cancer over the next five years compared to women who take, don't take hormones. So there's this tie between hormones and cancer, and there is another tie between diet and hormones that I'd like to talk to you about. And this relationship was first brought out when they looked at the change in onset of maturity of little girls. Same thing happens with little boys, but it's just real easy to see the change in onset of maturity of little girls because little girls do something very specific when they become women capable of reproduction. What do they do? They start to bleed. It's called menarche. It's the first menstrual period. And so that's been something that's been observed and recorded throughout history, something very important in every society. So they keep accurate records of it. And what we find is back around the early 1800s is little girls started their period around 17 years of age. And as societies became richer, places like Norway, Germany, Finland, Sweden, England, and the United States, as they became wealthier and their diet became, became a richer diet with more meats and dairy and refined products, what they found is the onset of maturity of the children decreases about two to six months every decade till now the onset of maturity in Western countries, on the average, is about 12 years of age. Let's take a look at a country that just recently changed their diet. Japan, back in 1875, the little girl started her period around 17 years of age. Just post-World War II, she was starting her period around age 15. By 1960, she was menstruating at age 14. And by 1970, she was menstruating at age 12, the same age as a little white girl in this country. Now let's take a look at maturity from another point of view. This is called puberty. Puberty is the development of axillary hair, pubic hair, and breast buds. There was a major study done and published in pediatrics in 1997 where doctors throughout the East Coast recorded the onset of maturity of children. And they found that the average onset of maturity of a little white girl was 10 years, and the average onset of maturity of a little black girl in this country was nine. And they found that 3% of black girls, African-American girls in this country, were starting puberty at age 3. And 50% at age 8 were going through puberty. What we have done is we have taken and stolen our children's childhood from them. We've caused them to mature 5 to 7 years before nature intended. And as a result, we've created health as well as social, mental, and emotional problems. This early onset of maturity of our, of our children has caused some real serious social problems, both with boys and girls. It's caused classroom antics, acts of bravado, acting out of children. You know, they've got to show their hormones out, right? It's caused earlier initiation of sex, earlier contact with sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, it's caused earlier pregnancy. It's caused more divorce, uh, more lack of uh, education among mothers. They've had to quit their jobs because... Uh, they had to support little babies, more poverty among the mothers. It's also encouraged abuse. I mean, when little girls mature, what happens is the male becomes interested as they develop breasts and buttocks, and 
when you're dealing with little children, they're more susceptible to abuse. It's also caused a, a problem of uh, teenage pregnancy. In our society, we have an epidemic of teenage pregnancy. And I hear all of these uh, social programs that we're going to introduce that are going to solve the teenage pregnancy problem. And I laugh when I hear about it on the radio or TV. We're going to solve this with a social problem. We can solve teenage pregnancy. What we have to do is we have to give our children back their childhood. And we do that by feeding them properly. So that at uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, our kids are playing checkers and doing their homework and riding bicycles instead of thinking about having sex all the time. And it can be done. It may never be done on a whole society, but it can be done for your children, your grandchildren. One of the biggest fears parents have is to see their child become sexually developed at 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And that can be changed. There are physical consequences, too. If you mature children early in life, they will be shorter because their growth plates close. The growth plates and the bones, they close as a result of hormones. And so you want to leave those growth plates open so that they can get bigger. It also increases the risk of cancer. You have a lower cancer survival if you mature earlier. also increases the risk of heart disease. And so we want to do everything we can for our families and also ultimately to improve our society, and we can do that with a good diet. Now let's talk about where these hormones come from. They come from various sources. <clears throat> One thing is the chemicals are in our environment. We have chemicals called xenoestrogens. They're new estrogens that are made. They're things like uh, dioxin and DDE, which is a breakdown product of DDT. And they are concentrated in these rich foods, as we talked about, because they go up the food chain. We also get estrogens from our body fat. A woman makes male hormones in the adrenal glands that circulate through the body, go to the body fat, and are converted in the body fat into estrogens. So the fatter a woman is, the more estrogen she makes. And of course, in our society, people are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 25% of children are overweight in our society, and that's one of the consequences of this overweight is that they're maturing earlier because they have so many hormones. Our bile acids turn into sex hormones. We make bile acids in the liver. And the more fat we eat, the more bile acids we make because bile acids are to digest the fat. And so when we're on high-fat diets, we make lots of bile acids. They go through our small intestine into our large intestine. Where in the large intestine, if you eat the rich Western diet, you grow bacteria that convert the bile acids into sex hormones that are now absorbed into the body. And when you eat the rich Western diet, your own estrogens recirculate. You make estrogens in your ovaries and your body fat. Those estrogens are supposed to go one time through the body, and then they go to the liver. And in the liver, they're taken out of the bloodstream. They're attached to another substance it's called conjugation. And this conjugated estrogen is now excreted through the bile system into the bowel, and it's supposed to leave the body with a stool. But when you eat the rich Western diet, what happens is the bacteria that grow in this kind of diet have the ability to deconjugate. They break up this estrogen, and now it goes back into the bloodstream for another circulation. And why do we know this? Because women who eat like we do have four times as much estrogen in their stool as women who eat the American diet. It leaves like it's supposed to. And you could also see the change in biologic activity that occurs in women on the Western diet. This is a woman's life from birth to death, 80 years. On a rich diet, she may go through puberty at age 10. Throughout life, she has higher estrogen levels, and she may menopause around 50. On a healthy, low-fat, near-vegetarian diet, she will start her period around 16, and she'll menopause about 1.8 years earlier than a woman on the rich Western diet. So what's the consequence of all this extra estrogen? Prolonged estrogen stimulation and exaggerated estrogen stimulation. When you overstimulate your organs, they get diseased. And there are various problems that occur as a consequence of overstimulating the female organs. When you overstimulate the breasts, they get lumpy and tender. It's called fibrocystic breast disease. Most women notice that tenderness and lumpiness just before their menstrual period. About half of the women, it bothers them so much they go to the doctor because they're worried about lumps and pain. They think there's something wrong. And about 8% of women, it's so disturbing it interferes with their social and their work life. That excess estrogen promotes breast cancer development. In the uterus, some interesting things happen. When you overstimulate the inside lining of the uterus called the endometrium, it grows too thick. 
Estrogen is the stimulus for its growth. So you have too much estrogen around, it grows too thick. At the end of the month, when you shed that lining, you have your period, you have a great amount of blood loss, which contributes to iron deficiency anemia. You have a lot of pain, a lot of clots. In some women, that bleeding gets so bad that we call it dysfunctional or abnormal uterine bleeding. And they bleed real heavy, heavy at period times. Sometimes in between periods, they'll bleed. And for that reason, many women have a hysterectomy. If you overstimulate the lining of the uterus, you may also have it break down into cancer. It's called endometrial cancer. For that reason, you will have a hysterectomy. But the most common reason for a hysterectomy is fibroids of the uterus. The body of the uterus, the muscle part, it has smooth muscle cells that make up this body. When you stimulate the body of the uterus with estrogen, overstimulate it because of the diet that you choose, what happens is those cells proliferate into lumps the size of a golf ball to the size of a basketball. And these are known as fibroids. And often a woman will get a hysterectomy because of these fibroids. The facts are, by the time a woman reaches menopause, she has a one out of three chance of losing her uterus. And it's a significant loss. One third of women have lost their uterus by the time of menopause. And most of these are a consequence of dietary diseases. Now, similar things happen in men. Men run into various problems from excess testosterone that is caused by the rich Western diet through similar mechanisms. They get uh, prostate enlargement. When you overstimulate the prostate, it gets inflamed, scar tissue enlarged, and they have something called prostatism, which interferes with the ability to pass urine. They have to get up a lot at night, dribble, they have difficulty with the stream, and often have to have surgery to enlarge the opening. They also have prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is promoted by high, te high testosterone levels as a consequence of the rich Western diet. And here's one, and I know this one will bother you like it bothered me when I first heard about it. The high-fat American diet promotes male pattern baldness in susceptible men who are genetically susceptible. I learned about this when I was in Hawaii. A dermatologist I knew came to me with an article that was titled, Can You Grow Your Hair Back? And I just laughed, and I figured he's just trying to tease me. It was by Dr. Inaba. He wrote a book. The book talked about how Japanese men prior to World War II had full sets of hair. And then the war came along and they changed their diet and male pattern baldness started to appear. And then he went and explained the mechanism, how when you eat the high fat uh, diet, the rich diet, what happens is you make lots of testosterone, which stimulates the, uh, the free fatty acid production on the scalp, which uh, causes the destruction of the uh, hair follicles due to the ex extra male hormone destroying the hair follicles. And since he had the mechanism all down, and since he, had, since he had that observation that he talked about in his book, I decided it would be wise for me to take notice. So here I am living in Hawaii, and I looked around at the men. And I found that my first generation patients, the older men who lived on rice and vegetables, full set of hair. And as the generations passed, and as the men ate more rich food, they got Fat, greasy, and bald, just like everybody else. In summary, I would like to talk to you about the diseases caused by the rich Western diet. They're hardening of the arteries, which causes heart attacks and strokes, high blood pressure or hypertension, diabetes of both kinds, but I'm going to limit my dis discussion to type 2 or adult-type diabetes for now. Obesity, arthritis, including ankylosing spondylitis, gout, psoriatic, rheumatoid, and lupus. Osteoporosis, kidney failure, kidney stones, multiple sclerosis. Various kinds of bowel problems like appendicitis, constipation. Do you know that at my clinic, every one of my patients knows what causes constipation. As a matter of fact, after the third day, some of my patients tell me they think about me at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Chronic diarrhea, diverticulosis, gastritis, and ulcers. Gallstones, 90% of gallstones are made of cholesterol primarily. Hiatus hernia, hemorrhoids, and varicose veins. The cancers, according to the American Cancer Society, that are caused, at least in part, by the rich American diet, are colon, breast, prostate, kidney, uterus, pancreas, and testicle. Now, th this shouldn't be news. I mean, if you're reading the newspaper, magazines, uh, you've heard that the rich Western diet causes a tremendous amount of disease. But I have to tell you, for some people, this is very threatening information. I mean, people don't like to hear about their personal habits. 
mean, think about a cigarette smoker. You try and tell a cigarette smoker this is hazardous to their health, they get all defensive and they tell you, oh, no, it doesn't apply to me. Well, you try and tell somebody that the meatloaf recipe their grandma gave them is going to kill them or that the lunch they're going to have with their friends is going to cause a heart attack or breast cancer. They get very upset. And so what I like to do is change the whole focus of this discussion. And I like to tell people I have not been talking about the diet that I used to eat and that you used to eat, some of you still do eat. I've been talking about the diet of a whole other group of people, whole other time in history, whole other part of this planet, totally unrelated to us, so we do not have to get defensive. I've been talking about the diet of these people. This picture was painted 190 years ago. It tells the whole story. You can tell the social class of these folks. These are aristocrats. The first man who's so thin, he has a wasting disease, which could well be diabetes. And the lady sitting next to him holding her stomach has the colic. And you know what's wrong with the fat fella. Rich foods make people sick. And if you're going to eat them at the, at the frequency of kings and queens of Americans, then you're going to suffer from similar problems. It's never going to change, and we're never going to invent enough drugs to catch up with it. The only thing we could do is correct the underlying problem. And I want to tell you right now that Mary's and my interpretation of how to correct the problem is not original. There are many people who have learned this message throughout history and learned about the cause of disease in relationship to diet, and also learned that you can cure disease by a dietary change. Let me take you back to one of the earlier references. It comes from the first chapter of Daniel in the Bible. Daniel's talking to his overseer 2,600 years ago. He says, Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who ate the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Now, admittedly, it's a, not a double-blind, placebo-controlled experiment. <laughs> but it has survived the test of time. They'd have thrown it out if it wasn't true. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. This is the truth. And this is what people have learned over the years and it's never going to change. But now that you know the message, now that you understand the importance of a plant-based diet, a diet centered around starches, vegetables, and fruits, and you know the burden of rich food and the consequences, then you can make a decision, and you can take the easy way out. You can enjoy the life that you have. You can look the best you possibly can. You can feel good every day, and you can spend your money on other things besides medications and hospitalizations. That's the opportunity that somebody fully informed has. And the body's a miracle, I want to tell you. It heals so fast, so quickly. And you can enjoy, regardless of the kind of health you're in right now, you can enjoy better health, and it'll be a better and bigger miracle than you've ever expected from any drug or any surgery around. I'm so happy I've had a chance to share this with you. Thank you very much.